nanohub.org. Online simulation and more for nanotechnology. You can follow along with this presentation by going to nanohub.org and downloading the corresponding slides. Enjoy the show. So we'll go ahead and get started now on uh, lecture six. So, you know, we've done all of the heavy lifting on transport theory. So we won't have to do much more of that, but we're going to talk about several other topics. And the first one is scattering. So, you know, I've assumed in all of these lectures that there is some mean free path and that it, it is probably energy dependent. All right. So let's talk about it a little bit and see if we can understand a little bit about this mean free path. Now, when I teach my course, I usually spend about a third of the course on how you calculate scattering rates and mean free paths. So we're not going to go into that kind of detail, but hopefully it'll give you some kind of general sense and understanding about how these things work. Whoops. Get, get my equipment working here. Okay, so these are the things that we'll be talking about. All right. So basically we've argued that we have this expression for transmission, mean free path divided by mean free path over length. And where does this come from? And what exactly is that mean free path that's in that transmission expression? We expect that it's going to be something like the velocity times time between scattering events. Right, the average distance between the scattering events that a carrier experiences. But what exactly is that relation? So we want to talk about that. So first of all, we need to talk a little bit about how carriers, how electrons scatter in a semiconductor. So we can think about doing a Gedanken experiment. And actually, you can do something like this almost experimentally. Think about injecting a bunch of electrons into a semiconductor that all have their momentum pointed in the same direction. You know, we might, you know, if we have a heterojunction, we might be able to launch them off of a heterojunction and they'll all be going in, or mostly in one direction. So at t equals zero, they're all launched into the semiconductor. Now, if you wait a time, and you would call, sometimes this is called a single particle lifetime, if you wait a time, all of those will experience some scattering event. So, you know, things will be somewhat random a scattering time tau later. You know, but it might not be completely random. So you can see here that there's some memory of the initial momentum. There's still a net momentum to the right. If you wait a little bit longer, eventually you'll randomize all of that momentum and there'll be no average momentum in any direction. So there'll be no average current flow now. That time is called the momentum relaxation time. And it might be longer depends on the particular scattering events. You know, if the scattering event happens just to deflect carriers by a small amount each collision, then it will take many scattering events to randomize all of the momentum. If scattering events happen to take you in any possible direction, any one, then the two will be equal. But the length of the arrow here corresponds to the energy. Let's say that they were injected with excess energy, you know, maybe 10 kT or something. So the length might, these scattering events might have been elastic. We might have been scattering off of charged impurities. You know, the charged impurity is just some rigid thing in the lattice that can't absorb any energy. So the electrons can change sign, but they can't change energy. So their momentum may have been relaxed, but they may still have that excess energy that they were injected with. Well, if you wait a little bit longer, They'll interact with phonons and they'll emit that excess energy and scatter from phonons and they'll come back into equilibrium so all of the arrows are shorter now. You know, corresponds to 3 halves kT or something. That's the energy relaxation time. And Professor Fisher mentioned these a little bit. In general, you would expect that this would be longer than the momentum relaxation time because if you get injected with 10 kT of energy, each phonon only has 30 milli electron volts or something. You have to undergo several, you have to emit several phonons in order to get rid of that excess energy. Okay, so that's what we mean by these characteristic times. So they, they all have a physical interpretation. Tau is the average time between collisions. Tau sub m is the average time it takes to relax or randomize momentum. Tau sub e is the average time it takes to dissipate all of that excess energy. 
Okay. Now, the fundamental quantity, though, that we, that we can compute is this transition rate. And, and so S of P, P prime. So think about an electron coming in with some momentum P. Uh, this is its crystal momentum, H bar K. And it makes a transition to some other state, so it gets deflected at some angle. Maybe this is a polar angle in 3D, it's coming out of the page. And it gets deflected into some other state. So the probability per second that that happens, we call the transition rate, S of P, P prime. So it's the probability that you make a transition from P to P prime. And be careful about the order of the indices. You know, sometimes people will write this in the other direction. You always have to remember, this is the way I've written it, it's from P to P prime. Sometimes people interchange the order of those two. So. It would be clearer if I put an arrow, probably, from P to P prime. Now, how does that happen? It, it happens because the electron, if an electron goes through a perfectly perfect crystal, you know, then there is no scattering. You know, the crystal potential has all been factored into its an effective mass, and it just travels through without scattering. But if there's some defect, or if we're at finite temperatures and the and the the uh, lattice ions are vibrating out of their equilibrium positions, there will be a random potential that will introduce that scattering event. And that's the scattering potential. So to do the scattering calculation, we have to identify what that scattering potential is. And then we have to figure out how to calculate the scattering rate. OK, but in, in the end, what we want are these times which make physical sense to us. What we can calculate is this transition rate from one state to another state. But what we want are these characteristic times. Okay, But those are easy to calculate if we know that transition rate. So if I've got a finite volume of sample, or if it's a 2D sheet, if I have a finite area, or if it's a 1D nanowire and I have a, a finite length, there's a finite number of states we can count them. Sometimes they're very, very large, and we end up converting that sum to an integral. Usually that's the case. So if I want the average time between collisions, I would take that transition rate. So I'm injecting an electron with some momentum p. The transition rate tells me its probability per second that it is making a transition to some other state p prime. And then I do a sum over all of the other states that it can possibly make a transition to. And then that's the probability that it is scattered somewhere. So that would give me the scattering rate, uh, 1 over tau. Now, I have a little arrow on the up there, and that's just to remind me that we have to be careful about these factors of 2 for spin that we often use. That normally, when we're doing these integrals, we say, well, there's always two states there, one that can hold spin up and one that can hold spin down, so we multiply by 2. You know, But for most scattering mechanisms, if an electron comes in with spin up, the scattering potentials are only going to scatter it to another state with spin up, unless we have a magnetic impurity, and then that could flip the spin. So if an electron comes in, it can only scatter to half of the states for the common scattering mechanisms that I'm going to be talking about. Professor Dada might talk a little bit more. He's going to talk about spin transport. Maybe he'll talk about spin-dependent scattering. So we have to be careful about that factor of two. You know, we can only, the number of final states you can go to, you can only go to a final state that has the same spin as the one you were coming in at. Okay, what about the momentum relaxation time? Well, S of P, P prime gives me the probability that you make a, a transition from one state to another state. But if I need to weight that by the fractional change in momentum between those two states, if I just made a small deflection, I wouldn't have changed the momentum by very much. So that scattering event wouldn't count very much for the momentum relaxation time. So we simply weight each state by the fractional change in momentum, and then we weight by the probability that that particular transition occurred, and we sum over all the possibilities. So that's the mathematical prescription that would give us the momentum relaxation time. The energy relaxation time, we would do the same thing. So we come in, we undergo a scattering event, we look at the energy of the final state. If the energy of the final state is different from the energy of the initial state, then we, we take the fractional change. If we came in with an energy E sub zero, 
if the scattering event, if we absorbed a phonon or emitted a phonon, we have a different energy, we just wait by that fractional time. That gives us the energy uh, relaxation rate. So if it's an elastic scattering event, there is no change in energy. And even though a scattering event occurred, it has no effect on the energy relaxation time. Right. Okay, so how do we compute those uh, those transition rates? So if you take a course in quantum mechanics, you know, people spend a lot of time talking about scattering calculations for various types of, of uh, physics problems. There's, you know, there's one particular technique for, for calculating scattering rates that's first order perturbation theory that's the simplest possible technique and which usually works pretty well for semiconductors. Most scattering rate calculations in semiconductors are done by Fermi's golden rule. Sometimes that's not quite good enough and people go to second order perturbation theory or more sophisticated techniques, but most calculations that you'll see done for semiconductors simply use Fermi's golden rule. And you can find it in any, in any uh, introductory quantum mechanics book. And we're not, going to, we're not going to get into it here, but I just want to acquaint you with how people do these calculations. So the basic idea is that an electron comes in with some crystal momentum P, it's got some wave function. I'll call that psi sub i. That's the wave function of the incident electron. It encounters this scattering potential, which is a short range potential that we describe quantum mechanically. And it gets scattered out into another final state. And when it's far away from that scattering potential, you know, it's, a, it's another plane wave. And that has a wave function phi sub f for the final state. So the prescription that you use for scattering rate calculations is that the transition rate from P to P prime is 2 pi over H bar times the magnitude squared of this matrix element. Now notice the order of the P and the P prime there. So this, this is where the potential for confusion. You always, when you write a matrix element, you always sandwich in uh, the the initial state is on the right, the final state is on the left, and the scattering potential is sand sandwiched in between the two. That's always the order. So sometimes people will write S of P prime P to mean what I'm meaning, S of P P prime. You always have to be careful about that. So this is a transition from P to P prime, and that involves a matrix element, and it goes backwards from P to P prime. So, and it involves a delta function, which tells us that we have to conserve energy. So, the way we calculate these scattering rates then is that you identify what the scattering potential is, you compute this matrix element, you ask yourself whether this was an elastic scattering event or an inelastic scattering event. The final energy is the initial energy plus the change in energy that occurred for the scattering event. If you have a static scattering potential, like an ionized impurity, it can't change the energy of the carrier, it can just deflect it. So delta E is zero. Then that delta function says you can only scatter to final states that have the same energy as the initial state. If you have a time-dependent potential, like a phonon oscillating at some frequency h bar omega, then you can absorb a quanta of energy h bar omega or you can emit the quanta of energy h bar omega. Delta E is plus or minus, depending on whether you have absorbed or emitted a phonon. So the delta function there tells me I can only scatter into states that are h bar omega above the initial energy or h bar omega below the initial energy. It just expresses energy conservation. Okay, all right, so the calculational procedure, you identify what the scattering potential is. You'll have a different potential if it's an ionized impurity. If it's a lattice vibration, there'll be a scattering potential. It might be roughness at the surface. It might be some kind of crystal defect. It might be scattering from another electron or from another hole. You know, you identify what it is, what the scattering potential is. You compute this transition rate using Fermi's golden rule typically works most of the time for semiconductors, except in some special cases. And then once you have that transition rate, you can perform these various sums, weight by the fractional change in momentum, weight by the fractional change in energy, and you can compute these characteristic times.
And those are the times that we are most interested in when we do transport theory. Okay. And one of the things you should remember is in a, if the scattering mechanism is such that it likes to just deflect electrons a little bit, then the momentum relaxation rate is much longer than the scattering rate, or the momentum relaxation time. The momentum relaxation rate is much smaller. The momentum relaxation time is much bigger. But if it's isotropic, the thing can come in and it can scatter anywhere with equal probability, then those two times are equal. Some scattering potentials are anisotropic. They like to deflect electrons by just a small angle. That typically happens for charged impurity scattering, ionized impurities, or if you have phonons in polar materials, the scattering potential is an electrostatic one and it likes to deflect electrons by a small amount. Things like acoustic phonons in nonpolar materials uh, uh, tend to be uh, isotropic, so the two scattering times are the same. All right, then we can compute the mean free path. You know, this is what we're trying to do, because if we, we want conductance, we want Seebeck coefficients, we have to compute this energy-dependent mean free path. That's what we're trying to do. And we think it should be something like the velocity of the incident electron times how long it, before it scatters. Yeah. Okay, so, but we're not there yet. So we have the time. And you know, let me just mention, I'm not going to go through any of these calculations. That, that would take more time than we have for the summer school. But, uh, but one, one of the things I want to mention is that frequently a first order assumption to understand what the scattering rate is like is to say, well, if I have some probability that I'll go from one state to another state, then if it's elastic scattering, what matters is how many states are there at the final state. The density of states tells me that. So one over tau is the probability per second that I'll scatter somewhere. And that should be proportional to the number of states that are at that energy. So frequently people start, if they want to understand how the scattering time varies with energy, they just say it varies as the density of states. You know? If I have two states, I have twice as many ways to scatter as if I have one state. If I have a thousand states, I have a thousand ways I can scatter. Now, if I have some scattering mechanisms that tend to deflect, that tend to select out certain preferred states, then you get slightly different answers. It's like ionized impurity scattering just likes to deflect you by a small angle. It doesn't have equal probability for all of them. If you absorb a phonon, then you need to find a state at an energy h bar omega above the initial energy. So your proportional, the scattering rate will be proportional to how many states there are, how many final states there are at that energy. If you emit a phonon, you have to find a state with a lower energy. Okay. So scattering rates for the simplest mechanisms just go proportional to the density of states. Okay, so just a little bit about scattering. As I said, we calculate these by Fermi's golden rule, but you can see what some of them look like. You know, acoustic phonon scattering is going to is going to look like acoustic phonons typically don't carry much energy, and it's not a polar interaction, so they're isotropic. They scatter you anywhere. So acoustic phonons will give us a scattering rate that's proportional to the density of states at, at the incident energy. Optical phonons in nonpolar materials are they're not elastic, but they're isotropic. So the scattering rates will be proportional to the density of final states. Now, if you go to a 3-5 semiconductor, then the optical phonons have an electrostatic scattering potential, and they select out certain preferred states, and it gets a little more complicated. What if you have charged impurity scattering? So if you think about a semiconductor that's doped, you know, usually we just think, well, there's n, n sub d dopants per cubic centimeter, and we just think of it as a uniform background charge. But if you look at it microscopically, you know, on the scale of this electron wavelength, you know, there are discrete dopants. Every time there's a dopant, it can, depending on its sign, it'll pull the conduction band down a little bit because of the electrostatic potential, or it'll push it up, depending on whether it's a donor or acceptor. So if you look, that conduction band is rough on an atomistic scale. You know, if there's a dopant there, it pushes the conduction band up or down. 
That rough conduction band profile will scatter electrons. That's the scattering potential for ionized impurities. So when I do the calculation with Fermi's golden rule, we're asking ourselves, you know, how will the electrons reflect off of a rough potential like that? Now you can, you know, one of the things you want to remember when you do that calculation is that it's anisotropic. Uh, it likes to scatter, it likes to deflect electrons by a small amount. Um, you, when you do the Fourier transform of the Coulomb potential, you just find that to conserve momentum, there aren't any many components that are out there. The other thing that you want to remember is that if your energy is very, if your electron is very high, it doesn't really see these little fluctuations down there. Meaning, the higher the energy, the less the electrons are scattered by ionized impurities. And that can sometimes be important for thermoelectric problems because remember this little delta above the bottom of the conduction band? If you can get the current to flow a little higher above the bottom of the conduction band, you get a little higher Seebeck coefficient. If you're dominated by ionized impurity scattering, it sort of helps the current to flow at higher energies. So thermoelectric people, you know, that's the reason that, you, that people worry a lot about what is the energy dependence scattering time or scattering length because it affects the parameters that you measure. Okay, so an important point for ionized impurity scattering is that the scattering rate decreases as the energy increases or the scattering time increases as the energy increases. That's kind of unusual because, you know, in most scattering mechanisms, the higher the energy, the more states there are to scatter to because the density of states generally increases with energy. So generally when carriers get more energetic, they scatter more frequently because there are more states to scatter to. Ionized impurity scattering is an exception. Okay, now you'll frequently see when you read papers and people are trying to do analytical calculations, you know, you, you have to simplify the scattering you know, have some simple functional form. And for many of the common scattering uh, forms, you can write the scattering, the, the energy dependent scattering time in this power law form. It's some constant times the kinetic energy, E minus bottom of the conduction band, and we usually normalize that to KT, to some characteristic power, S. Now you can see if the scattering rate is proportional to the density of states, and in a parabolic band the density of states is proportional to the square root of energy, then the scattering time is proportional to one over the square root of energy, so S would be minus one half. So for acoustic phonon scattering people will say S is minus one half. Now the calculation for ionized impurity scattering is more complicated. The final expression looks approximately like this but S is plus three halves. So a lot of times when people are doing calculations of Seebeck coefficients and conductivities, they'll assume that they can treat scattering by a functional form like this. Okay, so that's a little bit about scattering. That's about all I'm going to say, but now we want to switch and see how we can take that scattering time and calculate a mean free path, because once we have the mean free path, then we're home free. Then we know what to do with it, how to calculate all these transport parameters. So we have to calculate the, the transmission. And the key point is it's related to the mean free path, but you know, I always try to be careful when I talk about this, and I call it a mean free path for backscattering. It's a specially defined mean free path to make things work. So we'll talk about that a little bit. And it's related to these microscopic transport uh, processes. So we want to talk about two things. So first of all, let me put on hold the actual calculation of how we relate mean free path to velocity times time. And say, and ask the first question, why is the transmission lambda over lambda plus one? I kind of argued early on that in the diffusive limit this gives you the right answer, in the ballistic limit it gives you the right answer. It's actually better than that. So we'll see if we can derive this. And then we'll get back to how we find out how lambda is related to V and tau. Okay, so we have to do a little bit of algebra here, but it's not, that's not too bad. So we're gonna think about doing a Gedanken experiment. And this is something that's easy for us to do by Monte Carlo simulation. So, um, and you can think of yourself, you think, let's say we have a slab of a semiconductor. No electric field, we're not going to, no electric field inside it to accelerate them or anything. 
It's a homogeneous slab of semiconductor of some finite length L, and it has some mean free path lambda. And let me inject some electrons at some energy into that slab at x equals zero. So I'm going to assume that the scattering is elastic, so I can just take one energy channel, and we're trying to find what the mean free path is, or we're trying to find what is the transmission at that energy. So if I were to do this, and we, we do these calculations on a computer, you shoot 10,000 electrons at this slab, and you count the number that come out the other end. If it's 6,000, then your transmission is 0.6. So what comes out the end is some fraction of what you put in. So the current that comes out is transmission times the current that went in. And the rest of them end up scattering and going back out the side they were injected at. And that gives us the reflection coefficient. So if the transmission coefficient is 0.6, the reflection coefficient is 0.4, because I'm not allowing carriers to recombine or disappear or anything inside the semiconductor. That's just conservation of particles. OK, so, so there must be some relation between that mean free path in that uh, slab and the transmission, and that's what we're trying to find. Now notice, in general, I could be injecting electrons from both sides. I could inject some electrons from the right side and ask how many trans transmit over to the left side. Now if I were to do this, you know, you might ask, well, is the transmission coefficient the same? Now one thing you can show is that if, you know, and you can show this from Fermi's golden rule or, or other ways, is that if the scattering is elastic, then the scattering is always, the scattering from contact one to contact two is always exactly equal to the scattering from contact two to contact one. That's why I've never, in all the other expressions, and you know, we didn't get a question on this, I, I always had a T, I had two contacts, right? that could fill up the device. The electrons could come in from two sides, but I only had one transmission. I was really assuming that they transmit across in both directions with the same T. That we can justify rigorously for elastic scattering. Now, since we're near equilibrium, we have no electric field in there, everything is symmetric. So even if there's a little bit of, ice, of, of inelastic scattering, you know, we don't expect any asymmetry in this problem. So I'm only going to talk about one T. You know, what is the T from the left to the right? So here's the Gedanken experiment that we're going to do. We'll inject electrons from the left side. We'll try to figure out how many come out the right side. We'll take the ratio of those two, and that will give us the transmission. We're going to ignore any changes of energy inside there. We're going to assume that we can do all of this at one energy channel and then we'll just add up all the results when we're done. Okay. Now, I am going to assume that the mean free path is constant, otherwise things just get, get messy in there. Okay, so here's the picture. We inject electrons from the left. You know, we're just injecting electrons with positive velocities. Once they get inside the slab, though, they can backscatter. And now I have a mixture of positive and negative velocities. At the end of the slab, if they have a positive velocity, they can emerge. And the amount of flux that emerges is just transmission T times the flux that came in. That's the definition of transmission. Okay. And some of them with negative velocities, if they're at x equals zero, they can leave the slab, and that gives me the reflection coefficient. I'm going to assume that I have a perfectly absorbing boundary over here so that I'm not injecting anything from the right side, just, just because there's no reason to. I can calculate t without doing that. OK, now I want to write a little differential equation. I'd like to know how these positive and negative fluxes vary with position inside the slab. So I can write a little differential equation. I expect that they're going to change with, pos with position. So there will be some dx, i plus dx. So if that plus flux that comes in backscatters, it's going to decrease the plus, plus flux. And here's where I'm defining my mean free path. I'm defining my mean free path 
1 over my mean free path is the probability per unit length that a positive flux backscatters and becomes a negative flux. That's why I label it a mean free path for backscattering. Okay. That's my definition of mean free path. Right. So it might scatter, but it might scatter in the forward direction. Right? Then it's not a backscattering event. And that's why it's different from the average distance between scattering events. Only the ones that turn the direction around are the ones that are going to matter. That's how we're defining the mean free path. So the first term just says that uh, my positive flux will decrease because the probability per unit length that it will backscatter is 1 over lambda. But then I build up a population of negative fluxes. If they backscatter, they become a positive flux. So there's a plus sign there. And if they backscatter, they increase the plus flux. Okay. Now I can also say that the net flux has to be constant. You know, this is current continuity. You know, it's because particles are conserved. You know, so that's my continuity equation. So if I take the difference between the plus flux and the minus flux, that difference is constant. It's the net flux, net steady state flux. All right, so I, can, I have to do a little bit of algebra here now. So I can solve that equation for the negative flux and put it in the first equation, and that's going to give me, uh, you know, when I do that, you can see those two terms are going to cancel out, and I get a nice, simple equation for how the positive flux varies with position inside this slab. It's just going to, the slope is constant negative, it's going to decrease because the backscattering is going to drop it down. The current I, I, I don't really know yet, but it turns out I'm not going to need to know that. But I is just the constant. It's the net, net current. Okay, so this is what we have. That tells us how the positive flux varies with position inside the, uh, inside the slab. Okay, now let me integrate that. So I'll integrate that from some place where I know the positive flux, that's at x equals zero, to some arbitrary location inside the slab, that's i plus of x. So I'm integrating from the right side to from x equals zero to some location x. And the result is that we get this little equation. This just tells us if I inject a positive flux at x equals zero, then it's just going to decay linearly inside the slab. Okay, so we just have to be careful about going through the algebra here step by step. So this is where we're at. Now, let me go back and let me remember that the current, I, is the difference between I plus and I minus. It's the net current. So I'll just put that back in now. All right. Now, what I'm interested in is finding the current that comes out at the end of the slab. Because if I can divide that by the current that comes in, I've got the transmission. So the current that comes out at the end, I just have to put, for x, I have to just have to put the length of the slab, L, in. Okay. Now I remember that my experimental condition is that at x equals L, I'm not shooting any flux in. So by definition, I minus of L is zero. That's the experiment, the Gedanken experiment that I'm doing. So that means I have this expression which only involves the plus flux at x equals zero and the plus flux at x equals L. So I can solve this little equation for the flux emerging at x equals L, divide it by the known flux that I put in, that's my transmission. All right, now we're almost home free. So we just solve that equation for I plus of L, and we see that it's related to what came in. And in fact, we see that the ratio of the emerging flux to the incident flux is just lambda over lambda plus L. So that's the derivation of the transmission. And notice, nowhere in there did I make an assumption that the slab was many mean free paths long or that the slab was ballistic. It, it applies both in the ballistic limit and the diffusive limit and anywhere in between. I assumed that there wasn't much inelastic scattering. And I also mentioned earlier in response to a question that, you know, we frequently use this technique as a way to, we have a, say, a, a more sophisticated Monte Carlo simulation that's got a complex band structure and has all kinds of complex scattering physics. 
and we ask, you know, what's the average mean free path that an electron experiences? We'll just go in and shoot 10,000 electrons in one end and count the number that come out the other end, track them with a the computer, take the ratio, and that tells us what the average mean free path is. And it works very, very well, because if you plot it versus L, it obeys this equation. So that's the equation. And the point is that it is, it is more than just an ad hoc expression that gives you the right answer in both limits. It, it works in the quasi-ballistic regime, too. All right. Good. So, so now we, okay, so now we know what the transmission is. Now we have to get back to this question about how is lambda related to the scattering time. And so here I'm just going to give you, try to give you a sense as to how it works. So let's think of, let's think of a wire. Let's think of a, uh, of a nanowire. An electron comes in, it encounters a scattering potential, and let's say it's isotropic scattering. It can do one of two things. It can scatter with equal probability in any direction. There are only two directions. It can scatter forward, or it can scatter backwards. If it scatters forward, it hasn't decreased the positive flux. You know, if it scatters backwards, it's a backscattering event. So in this case, you would say only half of the scattering events really count for backscattering. So in this case, I would say that the average time between backscattering events is two times the average time between collisions. Right? And if I were calculating the mean free path for backscattering, it would be two times VTAL. Right? Most people will define mean free path as being VTAL. Right? But if we want things to work, if we want a device that is one mean free path long, to have a 50% probability that an electron injected in one end will come out in the other, we have to define mean free paths this way. Right. Okay, now if you're in 2D, it gets a little more complicated. And, and I'm, I'm going to refer you to a paper so you can see how it's done. But you can kind of see what happens. You know, this is a forward scattering event, but you lose some, you lose some forward flux because you're deflected at an angle. Um, this is a backscattering event. This is a backscattering event, and you've lost a lot of flux in that case. So you have to do this average over energy properly to figure out what the, the factor was 2 in 1D. It's going to be something else in 3D, or in 2D. It was factor was 2 in 1D. It's going to be pi over 2 in 2D, if you have isotropic scattering and if you have you know, a if you have an isotropic energy surface where you have the same density of states in any direction, you'll get a factor of pi over 2. Okay. Now, if you want to know where this comes from, I'm going to refer you to a paper, but you can actually give a proper mathematical definition to this. Its definition is 2 times the average Vx squared tau divided by the average of the magnitude of the... Um, so, you know, what is this? By the bracket, this means at an energy E, v, Vx is the average x-directed velocity at that energy. But we need that quantity times tau. And then we need to divide by the average magnitude. Remember, we're near equilibrium. So there's, so since we're near equilibrium, you know, the velocity is equally distributed in all directions. So if I just did the average of Vx, it would be zero because I'm near equilibrium. So if I take the average magnitude, then I'm, I'm only getting the positive half. So if you, you can work that out for any band structure, and you can work that out for any dimension. And when you do that, this is the answer that you'll get. You get the 2 in 1D. That's intuitive and easy to see. It's sort of intuitive that the backscattering mean free path should be longer than the, than the actual mean free path, because it takes longer to reverse things. And the amount that it's longer is pi over 2 in 2D. And the amount that it's longer is 4 thirds in 3D. And I'll refer you to a lecture on the NanoHub if you want to see this worked out in a little more detail. Or I'll refer you to a paper by Chang Wook in JAP where you can see how you can do this for a more complicated band structures. OK, so let's see. We just have a few things to discuss then. Uh, 
So I'm going I'm, to, I'll talk a little bit now, I'll get back to these questions about how we estimate mean free paths from measurements. I've done a little bit of that, but I sort of had to, I had to pull things in from the air. I had to say diffusion coefficient is B times lambda over 2, and where does that come from? So we'll talk about some of those things in mobility, and uh, let's see how this goes. Okay, so let's consider that I have a 2D resistor, maybe a channel of a MOSFET. And uh, I, would like to com I would like to determine what the mean free path is in this MOSFET. Okay. Well, I can easily measure the conductance, and I have a theoretical formula for the conductance. So the question is, if I've measured the sheet conductance of this 2D film, how do I deduce what its mean free path is? Okay, so a little bit of algebra here. The top line is the expression we've been using for the conductance, the sheet conductance. 1 over ohms per square. Now if I do a little bit of algebra, I can just rearrange these things. Let me divide by the integral of m times df dE and multiply by the same quantity. That quantity is what I've been calling the effective number of modes. The other quantity here, it looks like I'm averaging the mean free path and the weighting function that I'm using is m of e times minus df dE. So that is my mathematical definition of what I mean by the average mean free path. So if I know the scattering physics, if I know how lambda varies with energy, I can perform that integral and I can find the overall average mean free path for all of the electrons. But if I'm doing an experiment, what I've done is I've measured the sheet conductance and I'm just trying to deduce what that quantity is, what that average mean free path is. This is its mathematical definition. I'm just trying to deduce it from an experiment. Okay, so in order to deduce it from an experiment, all I have to do is to take the measured sheet conductance, divide it by 2q squared over h, and divide it by the effective number of channels that are participating in conduction. So I need to know the effective number of channels that are participating in conduction. Well, we get that by just weighting the number of channels by this function that picks out the ones that are near the Fermi energy. Right? That's the integral that we do. And we know what the number of channels is in 2D for a parabolic band. We can perform that integral, and unfortunately we're going to get a Fermi-Dirac integral, but, but that's the way it is. We just do the integral. That's what you get. So, if I'm doing an experiment, how do I compute that? You know, I have to know what the Fermi level is in order to compute that. A to F is the normalized Fermi energy. How do I get the Fermi energy? Yeah. Right. Well, the Fermi energy determines the carrier density. So if I can measure the carrier density too, and I know that the carrier density is related to the, to the Fermi energy, and I'll find the precise relation by integrating the 2D density of states times the Fermi function. In this case, I get a Fermi-Dirac integral of order zero. If I can measure the carrier density, I can deduce where the Fermi level is to give me that carrier density. I can put it in my expression for the effective number of channels, and then I'm home free. So the procedure works like this. We measure the sheet conductance. We know it's equal to that expression on the right. Then we deduce the average mean free path from the expression number two there. But in order to perform that calculation, we need to know where the Fermi energy is. So we do that by measuring the sheet carrier density also, and then deducing the, the Fermi energy. Okay. So if I do that for a non-degenerate semiconductor, things simplify. Those Fermi-Dirac integrals all become exponentials. So if I just do a little bit of algebra and simplify that expression that I had, uh, this expression that I have here, I can simplify this on slide 32, this expression number two. I can just simplify that for Fermi-Dirac statistics, rearrange some terms, and the result is fairly simple. 2 kT over Q divided by Q times the thermal velocity times sheet conductance divided by carrier density. The thermal velocity here is square root of 2 kT over pi m. Remember, there are lots of different ways to define thermal velocity. There's the RMS thermal velocity. This is the thermal velocity directed in a direction. This is the average thermal velocity of electrons in the positive x direction. 
Okay. So, so for example, let's see what would happen if I did this. Uh, this is my expression for the mean free path. If I ex substitute in for sigma s n q mu, um, then I can solve that expression for mobility. And I get mobility is thermal velocity times average mean free path divided by 2 divided by kt over q. That looks like an Einstein relation. It looks like something divided by kt over q. The something must be the diffusion coefficient. So the diffusion coefficient must be the average thermal velocity, 1.2 times 10 to the 7th centimeters per second, under non-degenerate conditions, times the average mean free path divided by 2. Okay, I used that earlier. I just pulled it out of the air. But you can see it, it just comes directly from the expressions that we've been using. Um, let me look a little bit more generally uh, about that, um, you know, what that diffusion coefficient is. And a way to do that is to go back to our slab. And let me look at x equals zero. If I want to know what are the number of electrons that have a positive velocity at x equals zero. Well, flux is always number times velocity. So the number is just a positive flux divided by the average x-directed velocity of those electrons that I'm squirting in. The number with negative velocities there is just a negative flux. And here I'm going to make assumption that we're near equilibrium. The positive flux is moving at the same velocity as the negative flux. Um, that means I know, let's see, n plus of zero, what am I doing in the next line here? n plus, oh, the total, okay. I'm getting confused. So n plus of zero is the total electron density. I have to add the electrons that have a positive velocity to the electrons that have a negative velocity. So the third line is the sum of the first two. That's just the total number of electrons, whatever velocity they have. And then I remember that uh, t plus r is equal to 1, so I could also write that as 2 minus t times injected flux divided by the average velocity. Okay, I can do the same thing over here. And I can get an expression for the total number of electrons at the end of the slab. Same kind of algebra. And if I look a little more carefully, I can convince myself that the line is linear in between. So what I'm getting here is We've deduced what the carrier density is at x equals zero. I've deduced what the carrier density is at the end of the slab. This looks like a diffusion problem. It looks like carriers are just diffusing across the slab. And I've got the carrier density at x equals zero. I have the carrier density at x equals L. The difference in the carrier density, I just subtract those two. And I get this expression. And if I want to find out what current that comes out, the current that comes out is just t times i plus. So I can write, I can substitute the second equation on the right into the top equation on the right. I can solve it for the current. And the result is this expression. Notice that it's proportional to the, to the gradient of the carrier density in the slab. This looks like fixed law. Now, so what we've discovered here is that just by doing this algebra is that I can write the current as minus something times the gradient of the particle density in this slab. All of those factors out front must be the diffusion coefficient. This looks like fixed law. So we just said, you know, what we've deduced is that current flows down a concentration gradient and that we have an expression for the diffusion coefficient. But I know what t is. It's lambda over lambda plus l. So I can put t back in here. And finally, we get a very general description for the diffusion coefficient. It's average value, average x-directed velocity times mean free path divided by 2. Same, similar to what we got before. So we're seeing this over and over again. Now there's something very interesting about this exercise. You know, maybe, maybe there was just too much algebra. You don't appreciate it. 
This is Fick's law. It says that particles flow down a concentration gradient. One of the things that people you, you see oftentimes, people worry about, well, if your structure is small compared to a mean free path, the fixed law shouldn't work, right? Because you, fixed law assumes diffusive transport. This says fixed law works all the way to the ballistic limit. That's very, I mean, there was no assumption that this slab was many mean free paths long. Current always flows down a concentration gradient. And that's kind of interesting. Um, it's not widely known, but I think it's true. William Shockley wrote a paper in 1961 who pointed this out, and people haven't paid much attention to it. But you can treat diffusion across a region that's one mean free path long using fixed law. You just have to be very careful about the boundary conditions. That's, that's where things usually go wrong. Okay, so we have this expression for the diffusion coefficient. You know, this is the diffusion coefficient of electrons at an energy E, because we're doing this calculation at a specific uh, energy. That bracket means we've averaged the x-directed velocity. It's the average x-directed velocity over all of the angles. And if we have a complex band structure, we have to do that average over all of those angles. Um, if we do this in, if I have an isotropic band structure, you know, then we can look at this, this in 1D, the average velocity, there's just one velocity in the x direction. So that average velocity is just V of E. In 2D, we did this early on, maybe the second lecture. We did that angle average in 2D, and we found the average x directed velocity is 2 over pi times V of E. If we do this average in 3D, the average velocity is one half the magnitude of the velocity. So the average velocity in the direction of transport is related to the magnitude of the velocity by these statistical factors. Now, if I put those factors back in to my expression for uh, the diffusion coefficient on the top, then we find that in 1D, the diffusion coefficient is V squared tau. In 2D, it's V squared tau over 2. In 3D, it's V squared tau over 3. And you'll frequently see this expression, and this is where they came from. Right. Okay. All right. Now let's see. Here we're going to talk about mobility. Um, okay. So frequently, if you read a paper, people will usually they'll do a measurement where they'll measure the conductivity, they'll measure the carrier density, they'll divide the two, and they'll report the mobility. So if you're reading a paper, maybe the only thing you have is the mobility that they told you. So if you want to deduce the mean free path from the mobility that you have, how do you do that? Well, we've measured it by using this expression. And we take the measured carrier density and the measured conductance, we divide the two, and we get a mobility. Okay. And from the measured mobility, we want to deduce the mean free path. So the idea here is that we have these two different ways that we could write the conductance. The fundamental way that I've been encouraging you to think about it, and the way in which we write it in terms of the mobility. If we equate these two expressions, it tells us what the mobility is. And this is what people sometimes call the Kubo-Greenwood formula, that this is the definition of mobility, just by equating those two expressions. Okay, now, somebody has measured the mobility and they've given it to us, and we want to determine what the average mean free path is. Okay, so we have this fundamental expression for mobility. This is what it is. So again, I can do a little bit of algebra here. I can divide by the integral of m minus df dE and multiply by the same quantity. And that means that I can write my mobility as 1 over the carrier density times 2q over h times average mean free path, and this is the mathematical definition, times the effective number of channels. And experimentally, we're given the measured mobility, the measured carrier density, we can deduce the average mean free path if we know the effective number of channels. And the effective number of channels we can compute, same expression we had earlier, and we find that then that there's a simple expression for the average mean free path. If I've got the measured mobility, 
and I need to know where the Fermi energy is, but I get that from the measured carrier density. Then I can take these two ratios of Fermi-Dirac integrals and I can deduce what the mean free path is. If we're non-degenerate again, all Fermi-Dirac integrals reduce to exponentials. So I have e to the eta divided by e to the eta, that's one. Things simplify and I get that the average mean free path is just 2 kT over Q times mobility divided by thermal velocity. I used that a long time ago, I think in one of the early lectures, to try to estimate the mean free path in the MOSFET. Okay. But I told you that I was assuming Fermi, uh, Boltzmann statistics, and I probably shouldn't do that in a MOSFET above threshold. Okay. So that's the way we could, could do it properly. Now I'll just point out that a lot of times, if you want to take into account that the, the fact that uh, this mean free path has some energy dependence. The simplest way to, to express it is in terms of a power law energy dependence. I'll use R there. I'll use R for mean free path energy dependence, S for time energy dependence. You know, then you can work out these mean free paths in terms of these characteristics exponents. And sometimes you see people doing that. So let's go back to this silicon MOSFET now. We estimated the mean free path earlier. Let's do it again, but more carefully. So the measured mobility is 260 centimeters squared per volt second. The measured carrier density under, at the highest gate voltage is, um, I guess, 7.9 times 10 to the 12th centimeters per second, or per square centimeter. So we can take this expression we developed for the mean free path. We can take the carrier density. We can relate it to the Fermi energy do the conventional expressions. We can deduce A to F, plug it in, and we'll get a mean free path of about seven nanometers. I think in the earlier estimate, when I did Boltzmann statistics, I estimated 15 nanometers. You know? So if you really want to get the right numbers when you're, when you're doing this, you're, we're usually working in this regime where we're not completely degenerate and you can't assume t equals zero type of things, and we're not non-degenerate. We're somewhere in between, and if you want to get the right number, you've got to deal with Fermi-Dirac integrals. Remember, you can get a little app for your iPhone. Search Fermi-Dirac. All right. So. All right, so that's, uh, you know, that's it, and then we'll see if you have any questions. So we talked about how transmission is related to the mean free path, and we showed how you can derive this simple expression, lambda over lambda plus L. Uh, it's important to realize, you know, when you're reading papers and people are quoting mean free paths, unless they're using this Landauer approach, they're probably quoting a different mean free path. So you'll be off by factors of pi over two, or four thirds, you know, depending on what dimension. So if you want to compare numbers, you have to be careful about that. But we have a prescription. We can relate it to the backscattering processes. And, uh, and we have ways that we can deduce this from the measured conductivity or measured mobility. You know, we can extract what the average mean free path is. OK, so I'll stop there and, and uh, see, if people ha see if we have any questions. Again, we have this fellow coming around with the microphone, so wait for him. Uh, I have a question that uh, is there any theoretical way that we can determine what kind of uh, scattering we have in our device? Yeah, so that, that's a very good question. So, you know, and part of the way people phrase this is they, they think about these power law scatterings, and you have an S equals three halves for ionized impurity and S equals minus one half for acoustic phonons. So, in general, you know, it's very difficult, but one of the reasons that, that people like to characterize all of these thermoelectric parameters is that when you compute these averages, like of the Seebeck coefficient or the Peltier coefficient and the conductivity, the energy dependence of the scattering processes plays out differently for the different coefficients. So people try to see if they can explain, you know, a set of parameters with the, if they, if they can deduce what the right scattering mechanisms are to explain the Seebeck coefficient at the same time that they can explain the conductivity.
Uh, the other thing that you can do, and we'll talk about this in the measurement section, is you, know, you can do temperature-dependent measurements. And sometimes you can see signatures of phonon scattering and signatures of ionized impurity scattering from the temperature dependence of the mobility, say. Yeah, yeah skip. Here. Yeah. Um, back at the beginning, you had a equation lambda equal average B times tau. And I think the tau was an average scattering time. Yeah. Um, I was just doing a thought experiment. Say we pooled the, pool the device tau, so we had my full mass scatter. Mm -hmm. Just left with uh, ionized impurity scatter. Mm -hmm. Then it seems the tau e would go to zero. Because it be, it's all elastic scattering. Um, tau E would. Yeah. Tau E would go to zero. Um, well, that's not quite. You, you know, so if if you injected, if you injected energetic electrons into a cold semiconductor, there wouldn't be any phonons to scatter from, but you could emit phonons and generate them, right? So you could relax the energy by emitting phonons. It's, you could scatter by that way. Yeah. So there would there would still be energy relaxation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But you know when we so for example when when we talk about phonon transport, very similar things will happen. You use similar transmission formulas for phonons. Um, when, when you cool a sample and you look at the lattice thermal conductivity, the mean free path can get very long. And then it's sort of determined by the boundaries of the sample. You're scattering off of the edges and things. So it's the same idea that you take the shorter of the, of the dimensions. Well, I actually, maybe my question still is kind of, it's still a bit confusing. So I guess we could still admit who's before now, which we're not going to change the energy no. that much. Right. But you can emit optical phonons. So if, if you if you inject electrons, you know, with 50 MeV of energy, they can emit a 30 MeV optical phonon, and right, they can. Yeah, let's yeah. say we're keeping keeping a low energy. Mm -hmm. Well, about 60 million electron volts per. Yeah, hour. yeah, yeah. So you know, if you were, so it's possible, you know, and. You could you could have hot electron effects. If you injected an electron at uh, 20 MeV, it couldn't relax its energy by emitting an optical phonon because that would drop it down below the the band edge where there are no states. So you would have hot electron effects there. So though so at low temperatures, it could be you know it could be a challenge to maintain these near equilibrium conditions. Right. That that's the way I would phrase it. You might have to apply microvolts across the, the sample, right? You'd be doing a, otherwise you'd be doing a hot electron problem, right? Yeah. Yeah. Time you seems to be made an assumption, P1 is equal to P21. Yes. So that intuitively that seems a relevant assumption, but I didn't see it come up anywhere in the derivation. Yeah, no, you're right. I didn't attempt to derive it. And uh, you can actually show it from Fermi's golden rule. I might discuss it in one of my 656 lectures. I, I don't know. Um, slide 18. I'm not sure that I have a simple one-line derivation of that. Maybe there is one. But what you find is, you know, when you do the scattering calculation for elastic scattering, it, you always get the, the same transmission probability from one side to another. But that's not the case for inelastic scattering. And, and you can kind of see why. Let's say, you know, let's say I have a large potential drop across a transistor, right? 
But we're doing this, you know, this E here is not kinetic energy, it's total energy. So yeah, let's say I have a, an energy heat and I'm trying to do this channel and I'm trying to calculate the probability that I'll transmit from contact two to contact one and asking if that's equal to the probability that I'll transmit from contact one to contact two. These carriers have much higher kinetic energy. They're going, to be, they're going to be much more prone to scattering and emitting optical phonons, and they have a much higher density of states because they're very much further across above the band edge. These, these ones have much less kinetic energy, and they're going to scatter less. So these two, are going to, these two transmissions are going to be very different if I have inelastic scattering processes going on. But you can show that if there are no inelastic scattering events, if I only have ionized impurities or reflections off of these barriers, then the probabilities are the same. My uh, actual question was, why is this important to the derivation that follows? Oh, yeah, why? Oh, okay. So why, why is this an important? Well, it's because I'm doing all of the bookkeeping in energy channels. You know, I'm, I'm assuming that everything is coming out of this energy channel. You know, if I have inelastic scattering, it's, it could be coming out of other energy channels. And, and then I have to, you know, if, if I inject something at one energy, it'll start coming out. My total flux that comes out will come out at a whole bunch of different energies. And I would have to add up all of those contributions. So the whole assumption that we're trying to make is that we can just deal with each channel independently. When we get all done, we just add the contributions to get the total current. But those, those vertical, that's what Professor Dada calls vertical flow, and that, that just, that complicates things a lot when you're moving between energy channels. Okay, we have another question down here. Uh, so I was wondering how you consider the, the transmission with the tunneling if there is a tunneling output related to this tool. Uh, yeah, how do, we, yeah, so the question is about tunneling, and I'm not really, you know, I'm, yeah, I'm not, I mean, if you had a problem like this, you, you might be interested in what's the probability that you can, that you can tunnel through here, right? So, if I want, and people do these kind of, kind of calculations, and the, the way they would normally do them is you'd say I is 2Q over H integral uh, M of E. Um, let me just say F1 of E minus F2 of E dE. And You know, now I have a problem in which there's a spatial variation, but I could quantum mechanically compute the tunneling probability as a function of energy here. And this T of E would be that tunneling probability. So people do these kinds of calculations this way. Sometimes when they do it in this manner, this is sometimes called a Su Isaki formula. You know, so in that case, you first of all do a quantum mechanical solution of the tunneling probability. That gives you the transmission. Again, if you assume that there's, that there's everything else is ballistic and there's only elastic events going on, that's also the probability in the other direction. You know, that's why I have only one T here. But that, that's how people do these kind of calculations. So you see people do this for like super lattices and things. They'll, they'll use an expression like that and you'll just quantum mechanically calculate T of E. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned that uh, uh, the scattering rate of the phonons it increases with energy because the density of space increases with energy. Mm -hmm. So if I consider a one-dimensional semiconductor structure, then the density oh, of space yeah. increases with energy, so yeah, would yeah. the scattering rate decrease? Yeah, yeah. So, good question. So we, we know that we know that the density of states in 1D 
density of states versus energy. Now, if I'm at the bottom of the conduction band, there's a singularity, and then it drops as 1 over the square root of energy. And this can lead to some interesting effects in 1D. The more energetic they are, the less likely they are to scatter again. So it, it could lead to some interesting effects. But, you know, if you have many subbands, each one has a 1D density of states. So as you start getting up here, you'll now have an additional state, you know, due to sub, this is due to subband two. Let's, let's say that this is confined state one. Then confined state two has some additional states. So it, if you go up high in energy, you may start populating many of these subbands, and the general trend still could be that it could increase with energy. But you do sometimes see these. Uh, they appear unusual because we usually think that, that uh, densities of states and scattering rates should increase with energy. But you do see some effects like this in 1D, things go in the other direction.